Dear Muslim brothers and respected guests from the non-Muslims who are seeking to understand the purpose of life. My speech to you concerning the purpose of life, as I always mention, is simply a means of communication. However, it's a very powerful, critical, vital subject. And before I enter the main point of the, the topic, let me first ask you a question that may stimulate your minds. Now many of you are, and most of you, are educated, well endowed, leaders in your own fields, fathers, mothers, professionals, sophisticated human beings. But did you ever ask yourself the question, or a set of questions? Do you know why you are here on this earth? And when you die, and of course, there's nobody that has any doubt, regardless of what persuasion, what denomination, what gender, what background, what church, what religion, system, ideology, or ism that you belong to, there's no doubt that everybody in this room one day will die. Now, if there's anyone that has a doubt about that, then you're the only one that doesn't have to answer the question, what is the purpose of life? Because you may be able to circumvent the consequences or the responsibility of that question. Of course, no one has any doubt about death. For if the benefactor of life, the causer of life, the creator of life, the owner of life, if that source of life had no other power over the creatures that have life, death would be enough evidence. Where is your destination? I don't mean where are you leaving from here. But where is your destination? You don't know where you came from. You say you were born. I mean before that. Where is your destination? Think about this question and ponder it seriously as we continue this presentation. Now, in the world that we live in, there are many beliefs, many religions, many philosophies that have been offered to satisfy or respond to this question. Because human beings are the only creatures on the earth or in the heavens. And of course, we're speaking about based on scientific fact. We're not talking about Metro Goldwyn Mayer or Steven Spielberg or Disneyland. They have some other philosophies that they will give us the indication to believe. But until now, there is no scientific evidence that there are any other creatures in the heavens or the earth who has the intellect or the faculties or the capacity of human beings. 
And because of the faculties that human beings are endowed with, they have the exclusive ability, the freedom to think and feel and to say I, me, and to express what we call ego. No other creatures have this ability. However, we know that, that even that ability is limited because when the human being is a child, there is less ego. And as the human being becomes older, there is even less ego. The height of the human being's ego is at the height of their strength, their development, their endowment, what they have, what they call strength, possession. But it lasts only an afternoon. That afternoon might be in some cases 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years. But inevitably, the years of the human being passes quickly. And as the Quran says, وَخَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَكْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ And we created, God says, He created by His own power the human being and gave him or her the faculties perfect Balance, complete faculties of intellect, intelligence, seeing, hearing, feeling, taste, touch, thinking, and the apparatus of the body. We gave the human being a complete set of faculties that is created that human being with a mold. But after that, after giving them, endowing that human being with that perfect set of faculties, then we return him or her to the lowest of the low. They lose the eyesight, they lose the hearing, they lose the smell, they lose the touch, they lose the taste, they lose and depreciate even the physical composition. Now this is what the Quran said 15, almost 1500 years ago. Is this the case? It is. It is only human beings that have the ability to think, feel, imagine, and explore. To propose and to determine. These human beings have over their period of recorded history developed and put forward many different concepts and answers and many writers, poets, sages, philosophers, prophets, and messengers, peace be upon all of those prophets and messengers, have come to tell us, you and I, what is the purpose of life. Now to be literary, We need to define life as it applies to the universe. And we don't mean to define life universally because we cannot. It's too wide of a subject. It's too far and we haven't explored that much. The time that man has been on this earth, man has come to discover a few things. But relative to the size of the universe, man hasn't covered even a pin drop. But man has discovered a few things about himself, his environment, and the world. So let us define life as it applies to the human being, his society, and his environment. And then let us consider the purpose of our existence in this respect. 
Generally, we find in the dictionaries the following definition of human life. One, the phenomena of existence. The phenomena, this means something which is unsolved, unknown, profound, and scientific facts yet have to be able to explain it. Phenomena. Another word for phenomena is called miracle. The phenomena of existence as it applies to one, biological development. Two, social dynamics. Three, psychological and mental processes. Four, the interdependence and interaction with the external environment. And finally, the complete synchronization of the many micro and macro systems that support human existence and the universe as we know it. Isn't that a profound definition? Next, let us define the word purpose. Because we said life, now let's define purpose. Purpose means objective, aim, significance, meaning, target, mission, reality. That's purpose. With these general definitions, let us surf the web. Let us approach our topic, the purpose of life. Now, in our discussion, the purpose of life, let's keep it all in context. What do we want to do? We want to know that as human beings, what is our objective in respect to why are we here and where are we going? And who is our benefactor? Who or what is our common benefactor that is responsible for us being here? Because when we define that, then we know who we are accountable to. It's very simple. Those of you who work on a job and you are not the boss, you understand the issue of subordination. And those of you who work on jobs and you are the bosses, you also understand accountability and you exercise it. Now some facts that we need to think about and talk about the creation of the world. Is the creation of this world in all of its complex forms, is it the result of the thinking of human beings? I ask you, yes or no? Yes or no? I just want to make sure we're in consensus here. Another fact, man is the most sophisticated creature in the known and explored universe. Now we heard about E.T. <laughs> but there's no evidence, no scientific evidence with all the theories and sightings of extraterrestrial beings and sophisticated civilizations outside of this universe that Star Trek has come in contact with. It hasn't been documented. Until now, man is the most sophisticated creature in the known and explored universe, therefore, if he's the most sophisticated, just like the boss on the job, he is the most what? Responsible. That there are inherent laws, both physical and metaphysical, that govern the universe and also govern man. And to make sure that we're not getting too abstract, Law is as simple as what you witness if you go to the top of a building, male or female, rich or poor, of any color, you go to the top of a building and lean over, 
you are witnessing the phenomena of law. It comes in the form of fear and apprehension, but it's the law of falling because you will not be able to deny gravity. And if you cannot deny gravity, you also know that falling from a distance will cause you some harm, trauma. That's a law that's inherent. Another simple law is that if you are a functional human being and you eat and drink, you will also from time to time have to use the toilet. All human beings, no matter who they are, how smart they are, keep this in mind, no matter how arrogant they are, what kind of clothes they wear, what kind of talk they talk, what kind of weapons they have, they're all just human beings. When you know that, you can still deal with them and keep everything in context because some of them would lead you to think that they're different. Everyone and everything in this life will inevitably be subjected to erosion, depreciation, annihilation, and death. Everything. And as we sit here, everyone here is getting older. Another day towards death. You can call it older, but it's a little closer towards death. And even as we say here, it's already there. We say now, it's already then. So even the present is something that eludes us. We only know the present by virtue of how the sun moves, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. And we wouldn't know that if we didn't watch the calendar or the clock. It's called time. We also know that the Earth is equipped with a perfectly balanced environment for the existence of human life, and that until now, with all of man's instrumentalization, with all of man's sophistication, with all of his exploration, man has yet to find another planet or star within his reach that has an environment suitable for human life. Isn't that ironic? The Earth is what planet from the sun? The third planet, isn't it? If it were the fourth planet, it would be too cold for human life, wouldn't it? Would not harness, service human life. If it was the second planet, it would burn up. Human beings could not live. They would suffocate from the heat. But the Earth's atmosphere is maintained and balanced perfectly from where it is. If it was just five miles closer to the sun or five miles away from the sun, it would fall out of its orbit and we would all die or disintegrate. Who keeps the Earth in that perfect balance and orbit? And who put that Earth there? And who put the ecosystem around the Earth so that everything on the Earth would complement it and also serve human beings. Who did that? The intelligence of human beings is specially designed and endowed for administration, accountability, organization, development of technology and industry. So it's no accident that human beings build things, that human beings are able to figure out things from the time that they rubbed sticks together and found and was able to build a fire from the time they were able to find out they could float on the water or fly in the air or produce their basic needs such as growing things from the beginning man learned that he had the intellect to implement improvise create design but one of the unique things that man should always keep in mind, whatever he's able to invent, design, engineer, improvise, create, it's always from something, isn't it? Always from something. 
Can man create anything, design anything, maintain anything, engineer anything from nothing, with no materials? No, he cannot. Throughout the recorded history of humanity, there have been outstanding personalities for the last at least 5,000 years, that is, 2,000 years since Jesus Christ and 3,000 years before Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. For 5,000 recorded years, there have been human beings came calling themselves prophets, messengers. Most of you and most of all human beings, whether from China or from Africa or from Europe or from Asia or from America, North or South America or anywhere in the, in the world, they know the names of these human beings because they were outstanding human beings, extraordinary human beings. At their time, because of their behavior and their impact upon society, men like Noah, Abraham, Moses, men like Solomon, David, Jacob, Isaac, Zachariah, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, and Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Peace and blessings be upon all of them. These extraordinary human beings over the period of 5,000 years stand out from all other human beings. Now, they were not industrialists. They were not professors of universities. They were not sophisticated in terms of their academia. But it was the commitment to human behavior and their insistence upon worshiping only God. Their common message was this whole phenomena, man in his, his environment, man and his challenge and his drama, man, the life that's given to him, man and his responsibility, man is the beneficiary of whom? God. All those prophets said that. Now it doesn't matter which one of those prophets that you prefer above the other. It doesn't matter. They all said the same thing. They came at different times, different places, to different people, but they all said the same thing. Man, think about your life and what gift has been given to you? It is God that gave it to you, and you are responsible to acknowledge the one that gave you this gift. This is what these prophets and messengers said. Recognize, conform, and worship God, Almighty God, without any partners, diversities, associates, without any idols without any pagan practices for God wants you to recognize him worship him and conform and obey directly directly through education worship and the acceptance of global moralities human beings are able to establish civilized behavior now this is a very important point Global morality. Now, one of the, global, the globally accepted moralities is that one should not take the life of another without justification. Isn't that a global morality? One should not take the property of another. One should not covet the wife, husband of another. One should not slander. One should not undermine. One should not do these things. These are called global behaviors. One should act decently towards their fellow man. These are called global behaviors. For if you go to China, if you go to Africa, here in Australia, if you go to Europe, if you go to Russia, you go to anywhere, they are what they call globally accepted codes of conduct. No matter what religion they are, or no religion at all, they still observe these globally established 
codes of conduct. We call them good and bad. Because if that were not the case, there would be no way to establish what is good, and there would be no way to establish what is bad, and people who thought whatever they thought was good would have their people, and the people who thought whatever was good on another side would have their people, and there would be wars just based upon the perception of good. Wars are not based upon the perception of good. Wars are based upon the perception of personal interest. But good and bad is well established. Male and female used to be clear. Sky and earth is clear. Water and ice are clear. Salt and pepper are clear. There are some very clearly established radicals, differences that even animals recognize. But humans, when their faculties become clouded or distorted, they are the only creatures that forget these radicals. Because things that animals don't do, humans, when their sense of morality becomes distorted, they do what animals don't do. I want you to consider the complex organization of this universe and think to yourself, could man or a group of men had anything to do with it? I think you answered before, absolutely not. I want you to consider the phenomenal diversity of the Earth's systems and its environment. Think for a moment. Think about the mountains, some which have never been climbed. Think about the oceans that man has been able to build machines to cover, deserts that man has been able to build machines to cover, but still, they exist. Think about the ecosystem, the atmosphere, the stratosphere, the ionosphere. Think about the atmosphere of just our universe, which is a small universe within the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is a very small galaxy in the Andromeda. And the Andromeda is only one of millions or billions clusters. Think about that. How then? Significance is man. How significant is the human being when we think about this vastness? Think about the recently discovered characteristics of the microsystems existing within substance itself. That is, it has been discovered recently that the atom is not the smallest part of substance. Now there are what? Microatoms, isn't it? There's something now called the quarks. They say, which is a millionth of an atom, a split of a millionth of an atom. And now we have discovered that every part of creation that has been discovered is inside of a drop of water. Well, the Quran already said that to us 1,500 years ago, that we created everything and every single thing from water. The Quran said that. Think about the anatomy of the human being and the intricate and complicated systems that are necessary for its functioning. That you and I, we can only go maybe 28 days without water and then we die. That you and I, if we are put in a room and we are fed and giving water and everything of support but no one to talk to, we will go crazy and we will die because we're social beings. And without somebody to communicate with, we will go crazy and die from depression. Think about the anatomy of the human body and its complicated systems that are necessary for its functioning. Think about the kidneys. Think about the brain. Think about the tongue. How is it that a person catches a stroke, and when they catch a stroke, they lose the ability to taste? How much would they pay? How much would they pay just to be able to taste an apple?
think about the stomach and when a person catches cancer of some sort and is unable to digest their food and has a bag outside of their body, what would they pay to have that repaired? Think about the lungs. Think about the skin, how it functions, how it breathes, how it intakes. Think about the fingers. Think about the 360 joints of the body, how they function. Just think about all the different functions and phenomena of the human body that man is still discovering, and if he has to investigate, research, and discover, certainly he did not create himself. Isn't it clear? Think about the discoveries of forensic science, genetic research, laser technology, quantum physics, atomic and nuclear energy, fiber optics, global telecommunications, and medical research, and still man lives like an animal. Man has not come up with a formula to be able to deal harmoniously with other human beings and to resolve differences without slaughtering the rest of his human beings. Man still hasn't come up with that ability. Think about the many food substances and the aquamarine substances that make up the common air that we breathe every second and minute of our lives and the many sources of fundamental energy that human civilization depends upon. Think about the many different types of energy that the human being needs just to live. Tell me, how is all of this possible without a power and an intelligence outside of the universe and the human phenomena? At this point, I'd like my brother to recite a few verses from the Quran. And I just want you to be patient because when we give a proof from the Quran, we want you to hear the medicine. Now, you won't know what he's saying right away because it's in Arabic. But out of respect for the revelation, I want him to recite it. Then I'm going to translate it for you because it's relative to my topic. <laughs> وآية لهم الأرض الميتة أحييناها وأخرجنا منها حبا وأخرجنا منها حبا فمنه يأكلون وجعلنا فيها جنات من نخيل وأعناب فجرنا فيها من العيون ليأكلوا من ثمره وما عملته أيديهم أفلا يشكرون سبحان الذي خلق الأزواج كلها مما تنبت الأرض من للشمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار وكل في فلك يسبحون. I want to remind you or tell you that this revelation, the Quran was revealed 1,424 years ago to an illiterate, that means a man who had no schooling, 
a man born in the desert, an Arab, chosen by Almighty God to receive a revelation. A man like Jesus, a man like John the Baptist, a man like Zachariah, a man like Isaac, a man like Ismail, a man like Moses, a man like Abraham, a man like Noah, a man like Adam, alayhi salam, peace and blessing be upon him, a man, a messenger, and a prophet. Now this Quran that he recited is recited by 1.4 billion people in the world and memorized from cover to cover 6,626 verses by literally millions of Muslims. Not a few, but millions. And it is the ambition of every Muslim to have a son or a daughter in their life that memorizes this entire book. So it's not a phenomenon, except that this book was memorized and preserved in the life of the one that it received it from God. And in his lifetime, it was memorized and it was retained and never changed and intact until now. Look what it says. I gave you some statistics and the basis of it was from the Quran. The Quran says, and a sign for them is the dead earth. It is brought back to life and then from it springs fruits and grains of all kinds which they eat. And we place therein gardens and palm trees and grapevines and cause them to burst forth therein some springs that come from the ground that man doesn't control himself. And there he creates his industry. That they may eat of the fruit created by God and their hands have not produced it at all. So will they be grateful? Exalted is he who created all life in pairs. So the Quran establishes that everything in life, everything in life has been created in pairs. Were the plants, were the animals, were the insects, were the fish or bacteria. Has science ratified that, that everything in life has been created in pairs? Yes, the Quran said that. 1,424 years ago. And of course, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he wasn't a botanist. He wasn't a geologist. He didn't have a microscope. He had no way of knowing that. The only way a human being, 1,424 years, could know that is through the help and inspiration of the one who is the creator from the beginning. Because that fact that everything has been created in pairs was only discovered 78 years ago, scientifically. Exalted is he, almighty God, who created all things in pairs, from what the earth grows and from themselves, the human beings, and from that which they do not know. That means, here the Quran is establishing, that there are some creatures maybe micro creatures that are also created in pairs that the human being doesn't know about. And a sign for them is the night that we extract from the light of the day. Now this is the phenomena itself that we have now discovered from going out of space. When we go out in space, we realize that the night, we realize that the day is extracted from the night, not the night from the day. We realize that night is first and day is second, although we say day, night. We realize now that time is really inverted, but you have to go out in space to be able to see it. That's why in Australia, we are sitting here at 9.30 in the evening, isn't it? In London, it is now 10.30 in the morning, but yesterday. 
And in America, it's 5.30 in the morning yesterday. But we just discovered that dimension of time recently, didn't we? We didn't know that before. But the Quran establishes that. Because listen to this. And the sun runs its own course towards its stopping point. And that is the determination of the exalted in might, the knowing. And the moon, we have determined for it, phases until it returns, appearing like a date stalk. Now think about it. Here the Quran has established that the sun runs its course along with its other bodies, which carries it. What bodies does the sun carry with it? It's nine planets, is that correct? Based upon the movement of the sun and the planets around it, we establish what? Time, isn't it? And based upon the movement of the moon around the earth, we establish what? Another set of time. Now, how did the Quran establish this 1,424 years ago? While the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he didn't have any telescope. He didn't know that. He could only have known that through the aid and the assistance of revelation or inspiration from the one who created. The Quran says it is not allowed. Listen to this. La shamsu yambaghi laha an tudrik al qamar wa la layl sabiq al nahar wa fi fanaq yasbahun. It is not allowed for the sun to reach the moon, that is to outstrip it. Nor is it allowed for the night to overtake the day, but each one of them swims along in its own law and orbit. When was that established? How long was it that Copernicus gave us a theory that man was in the center of the universe? Did you remember that? That man was the center of the universe. We know now that man is not the center of the universe at all. But 1,424 years ago, the Quran established that the sun cannot outstrip the moon and the night cannot outstrip the day, but each one of them are engaged in a predetermined law and orbit. This is the Quran. Dear brothers and sisters, all of this is to establish in your minds, all of this dialogue, all of this evidence, all of this proof is to clearly establish in everybody's mind here that you and I, nor all of us together, nor all the human beings in other places throughout the earth, none of us individually, endowed or unendowed, intelligent or unintelligent, educated or otherwise, rich or poor, black or white, male or female, none of us are benefactors. Who's the benefactor? Who's the benefactor? God, the Almighty, the Creator, your Lord, my Lord. This was established by those prophets and messengers, those extraordinary human beings that I spoke about a few moments ago. That was already established. I didn't need to come here and establish that. I just need to come here and remind you of that. Now, those extraordinary human beings were the ones that came to tell other human beings who thought at that time that they were somewhat sophisticated. Isn't that, you know, this is unique about humans. At every age, even 5,000 years ago, they thought they were modern. <laughs> at every age, human beings, no matter what stage of development they are at, they think that they are modern and more sophisticated than others. This is the nature of human beings. Yet all of them don't seem to ponder on the fact that they're only here for a moment. And some of them, during the moment that they're here, they become so arrogant. They begin to say that we, we, we are the owners. We are the peacekeepers. We are the organizers. We are the administrators. We are the ones who created ourselves, determined for ourselves, legislate for ourselves and others, and we own everything and we determine everything. Isn't there some people that say that? You're either with us 
for against <laughs> and don't give man don't give man a few tools that he can use a few things that he can throw or some missiles that he can shoot he really becomes arrogant then <laughs> well you know when Moses when he went to Pharaoh Abraham when he went to Pharaoh peace and blessing be upon him when Abraham went to Pharaoh and talked to Pharaoh Pharaoh told Abraham why should I worship your God why I have command over life and death anybody I want to die will die anybody I want to live will live what did Abraham say to Pharaoh what did he say to him if you really got some power the one you the one that, that you kill bring him back to life the one you kill bring him back to life if you got power and if you got some power when the sun sets in the west you cause it to rise and make it set in the east was Pharaoh able to do that he wasn't able to do that then and the Pharaohs today can't do it today because throughout the span of man's interaction with man there has always been the confrontation between the arrogant the worldly the boastful those who feel that they are the owners the administrators the materialists there's always been that confrontation between the materialists and the faithful the prophets of God whom I mentioned some of their names they were always the godly the faithful the people having faith and belief knowing that this world and all its tangible resources are the result of whose command God those people who are godless mindless heedless arrogant rebellious wanting to own everything wanting to expand from their place throughout the world and even control everything in the world and even want to control outer space and look how look how God sends signs and that man doesn't seem to want to heed it did you know that the space exploration project that the USSR or they don't call it that anymore it's called now the Soviet Union or the Soviet states, they got it now. They changed the name, didn't they? Changed the currency. I think they're even bed, they're in bed with the capitalists now, aren't they? Anyway, the, the Russian, or oh, they call themselves Russians now, right. So the, the Russian uh, American space exploration project that has now expanded itself to include uh, the state of Israel. Well, that's wonderful. That's a nice addition. Well, they were, had a very ambitious space exploration project that included building, what do they call that, that you look up in the sky and see it at night? Yeah, the space station. So they were building a space station so that they would be able to establish in the heavens a place to prove to us that there is no God up here. And that they would build a new frontier, that was Star Trek and his peoples called it. <laughs> and through their robotronics, they would create a new race of slaves that would serve them from outer space, spy on those on the earth, and control the whole heavens and the earth. They led us to believe that. Well, after this last failure, this recent failure, that they don't speak about anymore, this tragedy, this $56 million project, $56 billion project. Now keep this in mind, $56 billion of your tax dollars and mine 
It's frozen, paralyzed, the whole project. And you've got people up there at that space station that will die because they got to have regular flights back and forth just to support them. And they don't have any flights right now. And they don't expect to have any more for at least 10 months. So God has shown them just through one sign that's not where man belongs. That's not the environment where man is supposed to live, multiply, develop, or control. And let me tell you another little aspect of that space station project. They were developing a theory that they could take people that are in prisons or people that they consider to be dysfunctional or without any real use and they could transport them to the space station and just put them in orbit. <laughs> that was the plan, that 12 years from now they would transfer major prison populations up there and create prison colonies where they would produce things there but they would be in orbit so they wouldn't have to worry about them escaping. <laughs> Man, man is something, isn't it? <laughs> now, those prophets and messengers, they had their task. And what was their task? Their task was coming to these kinds of people then and also now. The godly people today have the same task to come to those people now and say to them that, don't you know that God is the benefactor of the heavens and the earth and everything that is in it. Don't you know that? Now, how do we know that there's a God? And how do we know that there's a creator that whom should be worshiped? Well, let me give you a proverb. And out of man came to the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessing be upon him, and asked him a similar question. And out of a Bedouin, because these were simple people. He came to the Prophet him, with a question. How do we know that there's a God? Or how do we know that there's a cr creator whom should be worshipped? Let me tell you what the Prophet, that illiterate Prophet, that unlettered Prophet, that simple man, that messenger and Prophet of God, let me tell you what he said. He said, the presence of dung is the evidence that a camel was here. The presence of dung is the evidence that a camel was here. The footprints in the sand is the evidence that a person was here. And the evidence of the earth and all the planets are proof that the same one or some great power has placed them where they are. That's what the prophet said. His proof was good enough for that Arab and it's good enough for me. <clears throat> Why should we not consider the theories of natural selection or the Big Bang or the concept of perpetual evolution as plausible evidence for the existence of the world or creation or universe? Because none of these theories can deny the fact that macro and micro systems are arranged, fixed, proportioned, measured, determined, limited, synchronized and given distinct characteristics and parameters that they cannot go beyond or exceed. Secondly, the fact that they have such predictable and recognizable characteristics allow for man to study, reflect, perform research that enables him, that is man, to reach scientific conclusions and apply certain technological instruments that provide benefit or substantiation to the evolution of his social environment. That's the facts. That's why that these plausible, these concepts of evolution, natural selection, or predetermined evolution are not plausible. The other consideration is that whatever position that you want to arrive at, you or I, concerning a divine creator, an almighty God, one thing is for certain. We cannot deny that all of us exist. Do we exist? 
if you agree with me that we all exist, that we're all here. I mean, I think everybody believes that we're all here. <laughs> we're all here. And we are being, that we are subsisting and being sustained through a unique balance of environmental phenomena that we are not the authors of, then someone, some great power, is, has to be, must be the author and responsible for all of this. Now those prophets and messengers, all of them, profound men, they all said to their people that there is no God except Almighty God. That means there's nothing to be worshipped. Nothing to be obeyed, nothing to be adored, nothing to be bowed down to, nothing to subordinate to except the Almighty. That's what they said. And they said that that Lord and Creator not only has designed the heavens and the earth, not only has put laws in the earth, but has also created a legislation, a morality, and a system for the human beings to live. Because would you think that as a parent, that you work as hard as you do, pursue your own education and your own career, and build a house or buy a house and have a family, and then you have children and you don't create an environment or you don't set down any ethics or any code of behavior for your children, don't you? I mean, even though some children think that it should be otherwise, I think most people, most parents feel that they have a right to establish law, principle, ethics, and behavior inside their home. Don't you? Well, do you think that you have more right to establish law and ethics and behavior and a system of what comes and goes in your own home, but that the creator of the heavens and the earth and the environment that you live in, this vast universe that you see, and witness and depend upon that the creator or the benefactor of that would not do the same. Those prophets and messengers said that the Almighty has given to man a system to submit, to surrender, a system by which to recognize God, a system by which to conform to God, a system by which to worship God, and we call that system religion, but that's not a comprehensive word. When we say religion, we think that's something we do on Sunday or Friday or Saturday or sometimes. When we say religion, we think that's something that we do only for God when we get afraid or we get broke or when we get drunk the next day. Oh, my God. <laughs> See, when you say religion, it has a limited preconditioning type of word. But when you say system, now everybody can relate to systems now. If it's only financial system, you can relate to that. System means comprehensive. System means an apparatus, something that functions, that everybody depends upon, something that needs to be maintained, something that is set something that has a criteria, something that is predictable, something that everybody can look at and function and be a part of. That's a system. Well, all the systems that man, what his mind has made, don't you think that the Creator would have a system better than that? Man has made a camera. Look at the eye. Man has made a computer. Look at the brain. Man has made nuclear plants. Look at the heart. Man has created apparatuses to do different chemical analyses. Look at the kidneys. Man has created all kinds of instruments to remember, to detect, to do forensics. Look how the human body functions. And so, does man think that he can keep records on other men and on the world and maintain history, historical records? Does man think that he can do all of that, but the one that created him can't keep tracks on him? Does man think that he can be accountable or that others are accountable to him, that he can govern you men? 
government, that he can govern you men, that he can create government, but that the creator who has made the heavens and the earth does